Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, final, I call it concluding plenary panel session. I have invited uh, very distinguished colleagues and friends and uh, the uh, uh, leaders of this community. We have uh, several general chairs serve uh, on this panel. Uh, and, uh, and we have one uh, remote uh, chair. Uh, he's already connected. So this is another hybrid mode of a plenary session. Uh, so very quick, uh, this is the, uh, the list of uh, panelists and they sit, sit there uh, in that order, as uh, you, you can see on the list. Uh, you know, several years ago, I began to realize that uh, there's an emerging trend or discipline, or rather I should say interdisciplinary, area, which I uh, uh, call it service, software services engineering. It's not just service engineering. Okay, here we are talking about services, now your service com computing community. It's not just software engineering. You know, we need to know how to develop a software systems using cutting edge software engineering methodologies, techniques, and tools. It's, it's about a software services engineering. Okay, later you will hear more and more about the, uh, if not, uh, precise definition, but you will know is contest. So in this panel, I hope that uh, by the end, uh, you will get, uh, uh, the takeaway will be that uh, this is going to be, uh, you will agree with us, this is uh, kind of like a new interdisciplinary area, which cut across several conferences we are here uh, holding uh, in this place. Next slide. So uh, after I have talked to a few of, of my good friends and colleagues last year, we decided to put together, uh, I call it a foundational paper. This is a, a manifesto about software service engineering. Uh, it's published in ICWS in 2021 last year. You can find it. Uh, so this pretty much give our, as a, uh, you know, it, this is uh, seven authors, a collective review about what ought to be included in this, uh, new, uh, newly emerged uh, interdisciplinary area. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and we've, after all the discussion, we found that uh, you know, it would be helpful to put together this kind of component view, uh, structure in layers, and also in the, the vertical uh, cross-cutting concerns, such as uh, AI, such as uh, 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 privacy, security, all right, so we put this in this way. This is definitely not the only way to represent uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this area, but this is a way conveniently for us to see this, this software engineering stack as well as all other uh, cutting edge terms such as you know, AI. And we also uh, in this paper talk about the challenges uh, in each of these component. Uh, for example, we talk about, talk about AI and now people talk about the responsible AI and here we call it ethical AI, and you will hear more from our uh, panelists on that too. All right, so in the very button, uh, it's too small for you to see, but uh, here I actually say, this is actually a human embedded computing error. It's not just a human century. It's not just talking about human factor. This is re really human uh, embedded in daily computing before and after deployment such as autonomous driving, you heard a lot from the past few days. Uh, you know, human can decide any time to take back the control, so the autonomous driving uh, system will be, uh, no, have to hand over the control to the human being, and the human may change its mind. So this human embedded computing uh, system environment you know, become much more complex to deal with. I received an invitation just yesterday to help review Sweetbox version four uh, if you are in the software engineering community, you know we have the software engineering standard uh, body of knowledge. And actually, I, I participate in that initial uh, version. Uh, so, uh, and I take a look at this draft very quickly because I just received it. Uh, of course, they speak in the beginning, they recognize uh, you know, we are really facing new challenges such as uncertainties, right? Ambiguities in this kind of sensor laden IoT uh, uh, based environment. Uh, but on the hand, on other hand, I start looking into the area that I used to do a lot of research requirements. It seems there's still 
in this version still think, you know, we have talked to stakeholders, we have to do a dissertation, things as usual. It's actually, in my uh, personal opinion, I have also uh, well, continued doing research in software engineering. That's where I, I, I came from. Uh, the way we do requirements are very different now. Okay, if, if we're going to build a smart city, if we're going to uh, design a smart home, we don't actually talk to smart home uh, uh, users uh, and solicit, no, elicit the requirements. We, we, we do what? We put a sensor into the environment. Right, we put lots of sensors in smart city, smart home, and we start to collect human behavior, right? Collect data. We do data analytics even before we start doing the software development, right? So, the new software engineering discipline, new software engineering education has to really emphasize the point so our student knows how to do data collections, create data first before you even start thinking how we're going to provide a solution. That's the way to do requirement engineering. It's not just sit down, do interview, talk to your customers. So, so it's a very different kind of uh, uh, era now, and software engineering uh, people uh, has to catch up. Uh, same thing for service computing community, you ought to know there are cutting edge, newer source concept of software engineering, and that can be applied in developing software services. All right, next slide. Uh, no, <clears throat> I don't want to uh, just keep on talking here. We have a, a meeting panelist, but uh, my, my uh, work in the past, uh, 10, 12 years is focused on situation analysis. Basically, I try to help the, the software engineers to understand that situation do change, and human being human are dy dynamic beings. They, they, will, they don't ever expect the human will have uh, so intention. That intention can change, human can evolve, can grow, okay? And human do lie sometimes, okay? In the past, we say do requirement engineering, talk to customers. If we are gonna charge, they're not gonna tell you the true requirements. All right, so human do lie. So, so it's very dynamic. If you start thinking about human factors, it's very different. Uh, it's going to be a very different world. I think uh, Dr. Yao later will also talk about human factors. So I'm going to stop right here, and we move to our uh, Michael Chair, who is happened to be connected to in uh, China, because he's not allowed, allowed to travel. So I uh, might pass this to the uh, second slide back, and Dr. Zhong uh, Jie Wen is going to talk about uh, what he sees in this area. Uh, Jie is uh, now your floor. Okay, thank, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl, for inviting me to be with you together in this panel. And it's my great honor. Unfortunately, I cannot go to Barcelona and join your discussion face to face. So I, I do hope this panel can produce rich outcomes, which may guide the future research on uh, software service engineering. Okay, let me uh, report some of my viewpoints on uh, SSE. Uh, I call it SSE in big service and uh, uh, internet of service area. Okay, in today's service dominant world, more and more organizations are offering their business in the form of services. And the internet based software services are continuously flourishing. Also, different services are developed and delivered by different organizations in different domains and from different regions. And of real strength is to connect these scattered services as public service networks, which play the role of virtualized service infrastructure to support innovative business. So many new terms such as big service or internet of services and crossover services are used to delineate such phenomenon. Okay, from, from the user's point of view, user requirements yeah, I, are more and more diversified, personalized, and cost grained So it's difficult to fulfill such requirements by an individual service, but how to compose multiple services from different domains and form a personalized service solution. So iOS facilitates the construction of such personalized service solutions by the customization of iOS, rather than developing a solution from scratch Okay, so we, we can find a trade-off between the personalization and the, and the solution construction cost. Cost, yeah. So compared with traditional uh, SSE research, such iOS-based approaches are more, I think, are more cost-effective, yeah. Okay, from another point of view, I mean, ecosystem perspective, 
iOS can be considered as a service ecosystem without centralized control and uh, and uh, keeping evolving along with time. So, for example, new services may join and uh, some existing services may be updated or disappear. So the evolution of iOS triggers many challenges in SSE. For example, so when, when the iOS is customized, real-time evolution of indi individual services in iOS must be uh, preciously and uh, timely perceived so that the customized service solutions could keep, could keep up to date. So another challenge is about the decision-making of service providers. So for example, how should they innovate their service delivery? Or, or how, how could they orchestrate their services with other services to adapt to the changing environment? Okay, so elaborate analysis on the evolution iOS ecosystem. So I think it has become an urgent demand in SSE research. Okay, please turn to the next page. Okay, thank you. Okay, so since iOS has become uh, has been considered as a as a brand new phrase of service oriented business innovation and transformation, so in this year's uh, we have a paper and we present a roadmap of business innovation and transformation driven by a set of service oriented primitives, including uh, servitization, publicization, aggregation, infrastructuralization, and cl uh, cross-platform interconnection. So uh, I suggest that uh, SSE research should pay more attention to the uh, uh, elaboration of these primitives in SSE methodologies. Okay, so it's the, the first point, uh, and the second is to consider the cost-effective service solution construction in iOS. So I suggest that more attention should be paid to, I mean, bilateral pattern matching based approach. So uh, customer requirements should be uh, elicited accurately and comp comprehensively first. And then requirement patterns are used to de delineate frequently appeared user requirement fragments. I mean, common, common appearing, uh, user requirement fragments and uh, service patterns can be used to delineate the frequently used partial service solutions. So based on domain knowledge and the historical service usage, so that the bilateral patterns and their matching mat metrics can be identified and uh, updated peri periodically. So when a new requirement arrives, the requirement pattern it covers can be first identified and then a matching algorithm can be used to compose the most proper service patterns and then get the final service solutions. So uh, uh, it, it means that uh, the optimization oriented pattern matching algorithms can, can be considered as a mandatory part of our SSE research. Okay, the, the last point is considering the evolution. I mean, the evolution of service ecosystems so I think there are two challenges that need to be addressed in SSE research. The first is I call it uh, external service sensing. So I have defined the problem I call it, uh, ESS, external service sensing problem. So we, I argue that service changes should be promoted as first, as, as first class citizens in SSE research and applications. So, uh, a framework for unifying related work and guiding future research uh, of, uh, of SSE uh, is introduced. And the second is, uh, I call it service ecosystem evolution analysis. Yeah, it, it aims to recover the evolution trees to identify the significant changes during the uh, ecosystem evolution and to discover the underlying driving forces of such evolution. So that, so that uh, governance and the regulation actions can be proactively suggested to service providers for continue, continuously improvement of their service delivery. Okay, uh, so this is my uh, statement. 
Okay, thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, thank you, Zongjie. So now we move to a, a slide deck number three, and our next, uh, the first panelist is going to be Dr. Rong Chen from IBM. Uh, he's also the uh, uh, steering committee, the new steering committee chair. After uh, after my turn. So uh, Rong, it's your time. Okay, thank you, Carl. Um, uh, I'm Rong Chen. Um, thank you for attending this primary panel. And um, I'm now with uh, IBM TJ Watson Research Center and also a member of IBM Academy of Technology that uh, advocates and encourages impact-driven technology innovations. And that's actually you know, helped me a lot and inspired me a lot to do the work I've been doing. And my research interest is distributed surface computing and the business IT alignment. And my current uh, focus uh, at work and also my personal, personal inspiration is about the managed composition of managed microservices based on the API uh, economy vision. And uh, when I did the whole work over the over several decades, the fusion of software technology and service technology has also become my major research focus. And at the Congress, I and other leaders coined a term called the soft serve to facilitating um, advocating the importance of this new important kind of a research area uh, that has been overlooked because because the dominance of the software technology or the service technologies, we think the software services require much more work and uh, in terms of advancement, and also in terms of the requirement and the practical needs we uh, we have. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm just using this one slide to exemplify the need for the new fusion of the software and services. It's like a DevOps. It's not just a loosely coupled of two different disciplines. So it's not a development uh, loosely coupled with operations. It's really a fusion, DevOps, one turn, one single thing. Similar thing, we think the software services should not be treated as two different things. We actually, in my organization, we try to have an organization called the software and services research. It's easy to get people somehow to identify themselves to wear the hat, say, I'm a software person, or say, I'm a service person. The reality is we need to have a single uh, discipline called software services. Now, the diagram here shows a very typical existing, uh, well-proven, fully proven kind of methodology of developing enterprise service systems, okay? At the high level, you can see we have a we have um, uh, three categories. One is about system requirement. In the middle, we talk about system architecture. On the right hand side, we talk about system constraint. Those things are very often overlooked by people who only write code. Okay, because when we talk about services, it's more than just the code. It's really whole life cycle. Talk about how all the way to operation, all the way to user experience, all the way to how you do continuous improvement. Then if you want to do that well, you have to find a way to automate. You have to find an intelligent way of doing things. The methodology we have today in place are good in terms of questions we ask. For example, on the left-hand side, you see the system requirement. We have a, a use case model. We have a system context. We have non-functional requirement. That's the answer to different questions that, that somehow need to be understood by all, 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 all kinds of people. But then the question now is saying, given the technology evolution, the same questions can be answered and realized differently. Then the question now is saying, do we have the right tools and the method to really integrate all the technology innovations to, uh, to answer those questions? The only thing I want to mention uh, leave from this chart is the so-called operational model that actually is the critical uh, artifact, what we, we call work product with whole effort, because that one really take all the uh, kind of other artifacts, like a component model that many people are familiar with, 
like the, the, the constraint and stand those into a single integrated box. That is already hard to do using the traditional enterprise computing technology and infrastructure. Now with today's hybrid cloud and AI thing, it, the, it, it makes the operational model artifacts very, very difficult to produce and very difficult to maintain and very difficult to automate. I just want to bring people's awareness and using this one as an example. This is not just software technology, it's not just a service technology, it's really a software service technology issue. Thank you, Ron. We move to deck number four, Stephen Yao. Could you uh, move to that uh, slide deck? Uh, our next uh, panelist is going to talk about the uh, software service development. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Yao, uh, you can please have a podium. Thank you. Well, uh, what I try <coughs> to look at is, <coughs> look at uh, in the past, up to now, when we develop software, what we do? <clears throat> I teach software uh, courses for many years, always <coughs> emphasize requirement, okay? <laughs> That's true. Right now, there are a lot of automated tool or semi-automated tool to help in the de design, testing, and the documentation, all those subsequent phases. But the requirement is very difficult. Now, first of all, let me re-emphasize the difficulty of requirement. Difficulty of the requirement is not only the user or the customer say, I want this, I want this, and I want that not only in terms of the functional requirement, but also on the non-functional requirement, including security, performance, uh, and uh, <coughs> other, uh, other type of uh, quality feature. Well, that's a very complicated. And uh, that's why it's uh, always the most important part. And when I teach a uh, software security course, for example, well, we give a course uh, project for the student. One semester, very short. So the real time, the real amount of time the student can work on the project is about 10 weeks, although the semester is 15 weeks. Because uh, first of all, mm -hmm. have to tell the student what kind of a course project. Too complicated, out of hand. Not enough time. And uh, we cannot teach those uh, technology or technique for students to use. So, for example, like a banking system, healthcare system, those are well understood. But of course, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the system, the problem we give to the student, not a full-fledged system. It's a scattered system. But then ask the student, hey, you have to figure out what are the security requirements. That's exactly what we teach. Uh, in the software security class. And uh, it's uh, very helpful because I don't tell the student what a requirement, but I say, hey, you, when you finish the requirement uh, analysis and uh, come up with a design document, that's your first uh, deliverable and we are going to look at. But uh, that's uh, the traditional way and what we can catch and what we can capture the uh, real information for the services the variety of services is very limited. Usually what we do, domain knowledge, and ask an expert, what? <laughs> That's easy to escape our responsibility, put the uh, problem to the expert, right? But uh, now, I think it's a lot more complicated. If we look at our services, including the service, uh, the social aspect, like uh, Google and uh, Facebook and so forth, they collect so many data, very relevant, and we never think about. And uh, some uh, political problems, economic problem, and uh, social problem, but uh, now we need a discovery because uh, the real important part is <coughs> the information technology to service the mankind. Doesn't matter what kind of application. Well, <clears throat> the first uh, keynote speaker of this Congress, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Criono, 
Corioni, uh, gave a very excellent talk. I introduced him, and I listened every word what he said. Very good. And in addition to the modeling and uh, so forth, the new technology, like uh, <clears throat> quantum computing, come out. In fact, uh, after his talk, I chatted with him. I said, hey, look at uh, the use of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the concept and a lot of technique of artificial intelligence existed for the 50 years last. But why all of a sudden, only during the last 20, 30 years, things everybody jump on the bandwagon and talk about artificial intelligence, of course, uh, machine learning, you know, uh, you can update the system uh, uh, automatically, and uh, when you, while you use it, uh, you get a better understand. But that's uh, too passive. How about at the beginning, when you design the system, where you start from? Expert, domain knowledge, those are just the vague term. We don't know what we, so the accelerate discovery is a very, very helpful. And uh, so I was very excited, that's the area. But also we have the new technology come out, like quantum computing. One of the major bottleneck use the artificial intelligence, it requires a large amount of data. Otherwise, you just get the algorithm and the learning algorithm and so forth, but no data, you have no substance. Any application you talk about, you need a data. But the data, large amount of data, no use. You want a critical data. And how you collect them and capture them and put it in use. But then, the amount of computation is very extensive. So, uh, what well, <clears throat> neural network and those things seem to come out, and uh, they will have a more powerful com computer technology and a faster uh, uh, computation that help help out. But what the real another bottleneck is how you get the data, the critical data applied to the computation. That's a lot of challenge. But that directly affect our quality of service. And at the end, we wanted to produce the software to implement, okay? And then, of course, uh, there are a lot of other techniques uh, already uh, uh, used uh, very, uh, uh, quite a bit, and it was a lot of success, like including blockchain. Blockchain is very helpful in the software security area. But I also get a serious deficiency because of the amount of redundancy and also the protection of uh, other uh, the various operations and so forth. But then the success we already have is apply the right place in the complicated development process, like a coordinated software development. Software development, large scale, complicated, it's very complicated, involves many, many people and a different team. And, but you coordinate. If you cannot coordinate well, you never get a good software. Coordination it doesn't require that much complicated extension. And when you apply the uh, uh, blockchain that has been shown, there's a good way to use a smart contract and so forth to. <coughs> Uh, build up the uh, coordination, trustworthiness uh, among all the developers. Okay, now then we talk about all these things integrate together. So not only we talk about the data and attract the knowledge of the si uh, service system, but also the technology change. When the new technology come out, uh, <clears throat> then uh, we make a effective use. But every time when you use it, it's always there, but that's the challenge in research we have to do. Then when we get down to the next, after you develop, then how you're going to put in implementation? Implementation, not just the software implementation, but the hardware. Some of the embedded system, you need a semiconductor chips, okay? <laughs> And I talk about the electronic system, A, IoT. How you put in IoT, the microscope? 
especially in many of the uh, uh, sophisticated applications like uh, intelligent transportation system, electric car, and so forth. Now we already have an electric car. I have been in variety electric car. I saw people, hey, really? They work in the electric car when they get into the frac uh, traffic jam. That's an electric car automatically do that. But uh, all those, you cannot put in implementation with a powerful and <clears throat> reliable, secure semiconductor chips. As you, we all know, a lot of the things that the currently the advanced technology in many of the system <clears throat> is the reliable, secure uh, semiconductor chips. So when we look at the whole electron, uh, the development process, it's a very extensive, not only the data and so forth, and the new technology emerge, and also the, where's the bottleneck, and where the user feedback. User feedback is not a sophisticated computer design or software designer's feedback. So average user, like an iPhone. So in order to have very good progress and to achieve our goal to provide reliable and secure and whatever system you expect to have in your service system, we must look at a much broader uh, view and all these things must be into take consideration. So right, this is a very challenge, especially for educational system. In fact, we always think about Hey, we keep adding the new knowledge to the student. What student have to, we have to extend the four year program to six year program. And even that, that's not enough. So one of the <coughs> challenges what we are doing now is how do we teach the student with the uh, uh, right material very quickly. I talked too long, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. okay. We're, we're really behind, but that's okay. Uh, we move to uh, start deck number five. And our next panelist is a cloud generator, uh, Hang. Yeah. I want to just quickly uh, <clears throat> start with a, a story. So um, a few weeks before the event, Carl asked me to participate on this panel. And uh, he gave me a homework uh, to help the Carl and, and Wong come up with a vision where services, technologies are going. And then also, how can we transform our current Congress towards that vision? So while coming to this event, we're staying in Barcelona downtown. Uh, every morning I will hop on the bus. I will uh, listen to two gentlemen and then play back. And I say, no, you didn't understand it. <laughs> so the next day, Tuesday, I come on the bus and say, is this what you meant? They say, no, you don't understand it. You know, it's not easy to understand the visionary people. It takes a lot of time. So I finally offered to them to play as a guinea pig to their vision and keep on playing back until, you know, I pass the exam. So the only way I could understand it is to look through my glasses, just like each one of you will look through your own glasses. You're doing your own jobs. So you need to find yourself in that vision. So that's what I tried. So I started with two things. The first was taking the slides that I presented a couple of days ago uh, and see how their vision maps on that. And then I created a few more slides to see how we can take this Congress in that vision. So can you please show the next slide? So I offered um, not, not a vision, but a summary of what I thought mega trends are today. Uh, and for me, the three key mega trends are digital transformation, sustainability, and metaverse. I thought Services are a central part of digital transformation already, so we're doing that. There's not much to advance. However, we are not yet there in terms of sustainability. Metaverse, virtualized, simulate everything is far out. So I kind of zeroed down on sustainability. I said, we should really focus on sustainability. It's not a major transformation, but if we are really... Uh, thoughtful about sustainability, we can make the whole industry happy. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, please. And, and it's kind of reflected here. You see, we already traveled down digital transformation, this S-curve, 
we are now embarking on sustainability and, and we should drive on that curve. And once we eventually get to the metaverse, we should revisit. So we kind of have where we should go and, and also can keep an eye on the further future. And you heard Wendy Hall mention it for internet. So it kind of makes sense, but we're not yet there. Next slide. Then I thought, well, how do we map it on existing technologies? So this is how we think about it at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And you can see if you go, I know you can't read it, but every single nested box, whether you expand it or you collapse it, can have interpretation in the services. Starting from, you know, not monitoring IT components, IoT sensors, then you expand beyond IT, including, you know, other physical artifacts, which will eventually go into the metaverse, but we're not yet there. Then you uh, go to the edge, you do AI, machine learning, incident analytics, and then you start using this information for demand shaping. So every single piece is there and could be mapped to the services. So if we look at all our conferences, everything we do, if we put our sustainability hat, we can enrich the experience and bring back to the mother earth what we're taking by running all these blockchains, distributed ledgers, et cetera. So now that we've potentially traveled down that path of sustainability, how do we apply to our conferences? <clears throat> So uh, my esteemed colleague, Rong Cheng and uh, Carl Cheng, they think, and, and I can almost sense it, even though I'm not as advanced as them, not yet there, still have a few more bus rides with them to understand. They're talking about soft serve engineering. And then I thought, well, how does it map? I mean, it really maps to the Congress, but Congress is these plenary sessions and keynotes. What's the conference we should take? And then they say, very rightfully so, ICWS has history, you know, we shouldn't touch it. Cloud is pretty successful today, not because of me as a general chair, but because of all of you who write successful papers. And they have a bunch of other papers, but a bunch of other conferences like Digital Health and Quantum and Edge. And But there's one, SEC, that, that was kind of mapping to everything. And that next slide, please. So if we look at today's vision, I suggest we move it to the next slide, please, where SEC can take a little bit of every conference and, and be the common tool for all of them. Then suddenly, finally, I'm starting to understand a little bit the vision of Carl and Wrong. And if you go to the next slide, but I needed for my own sake, not for their sake, to list what are the topics that are common to everyone every conference and, and these are foundations of services you can apply to any of these conferences it's servitization how you take it being digital health quantum it's engineering how you make it happen you could still at each of, of these conferences have that conference specific but general principle practices then co-design for new hardware personalization ux ethics self-service etc cetera, etc cetera. those are the common themes that apply to all and perhaps, just perhaps, I have finally understand the vision of my two esteemed colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. We will move to uh, Congress General Chair, uh, Ernesto Damiani, deck number six. Okay, thank you very much. I, I have a single slide, so this is a, but uh, I will sp speak a little bit on this slide if you don't mind. Of course, uh, I knew I wasn't the first to speak, so many of the things that uh, I agree upon were mentioned and uh, the vision that uh, we are going to enter into an exciting era in which the engineering of services and engineering of software will be basically take need a holistic approach. I, I entirely uh, share that view. But I would like uh, to speak on one specific thing, which is basically, uh, well, how we, our community, what will be our role in the introduction of artificial intelligence techniques in the in the continuum and i don't want to say in the network because otherwise people will think it's a matter of you know low level protocols i don't want to say in the cloud i would like just to point you just came to my mind 2019 with uh, Benjamino di martino colleague from naples we published a column on ieee internet computing which was the ai powered cloud and basically in 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 that column, we, we were trying to say an early version of what I want to say now. So it's not just the network, it's not just the software, it is not just the, the uh, edge 
or, or it's a continuum where which is becoming a, which is will be the execution platform for uh, all the infrastructure that well uh, we, we heard it from the keynote this morning the infrastructure where the big applications will be executed and in this continuum there is no other way than be intelligent intelligent means that you are not only intelligent at design time which fine you must be intelligent design time we know and we heard about uh, software engineering and the requirements oriented basically it's knowledge we have a priori but there is a lot of knowledge that we cannot we don't have a priori and that we we will not be able to have it a priori the knowledge about the execution situation the knowledge about the changing user needs even the location uh, i don't know if yesterday you you heard the discussion about what happens the notion that you we are going to uh, start to stop assuming that we know the location of, of people over the network, even the virtual location, even the address location. And this changes a lot. So we have this notion that we uh, will need to be intelligent at the moment. And this brings back a topic we discussed it on the bus as well a couple of times uh, during this day, this week, this, uh, this week uh, which is the topic of uh, autonomous intelligence or the autonomous intelligence of the environment and this is where we need to uh, handle the or, or to take the artificial intelligence challenge because this intelligence in the environment cannot be brought uh, with uh, uh, let's say standard techniques we will need our own type of learning it will be probably more this is just my my personal prediction more of the semi-supervised type than of the supervised type and for why? Because the conditions in which the systems are being are being uh, uh, executed, in which the big application will work, uh, the, those conditions are only partially no a priori. It's very difficult to, to and there is a, a challenge, which is can this type of behavior be generated via generative models, which is which is uh, still open, I believe. But in case it can't, we will need semi-supervised uh, certainly. But we will need our own type of intelligence, the intelligence of the infrastructure, the intelligence of the continuum to be able to handle uh, the execution conditions. So what should we do? So this is basically my uh, preliminary statement. I think we cannot, this, it must be us. It will not be the machine learning people. It will be us because we, you need to understand the knowledge representation and the knowledge handling issues that are uh, specific of the service uh, delivery of the service deployment of the service execution so we can help ask help but we need also to be able to propose ourselves our solutions and uh, uh, we, we need to, to do it as a community so let me just go through very quickly these four ballots first of all as a community means that uh, and we had a good example here during this congress i hope this example is developed in the next editions having together the academic having the operators sitting here having the companies and uh, well uh, i know that wrong shares this view we we need to talk continuously together about that we need uh, to uh, be able to apply uh, to make our systems intelligence at the design time at the configuration time at the execution time enabling them to find autonomously or semi-autonomously the right configuration and yesterday i believe that we all got convinced that uh, this is essential if we will have for example metaverse type of application running we cannot do them with a priori uh, configuration and a priori design only they need to be adaptive in the field finally we need to be practical we are a service community <laughs> so so we have to deliver services that work and of course even there is an academic side there is a foundational side Atman here will probably mention that but we need to make sure that the type of foundational research that we do can actually contribute to the overall evolution of the platform. And let me finish after the keynote this morning. We must also recognize that many of the concepts and the behaviors that we will implement will be ethically loaded. And so we will need to take responsibility for that. Uh, we cannot just pretend we don't know. So network uh, 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 neutrality is one of, but only one of the of those uh, concepts that uh, that uh, we will need to take into account. So I stop here and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, we move to uh, Atherman uh, Bukhetaya.
for the uh, style set number seven. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Carl. Um, before actually I talk uh, about uh, what I'm about to talk about, I would like first to um, start by saying that we probably should not reinvent the wheel in the sense that um, we should always look for the best practice in other areas uh, so to define actually directions. Um, uh, my early background was actually in the area of databases. Then I moved to service computing. I think they, they, they got it right, if you want my opinion. So you have, you know, if in terms of the conferences and then the focus, they have um, a database, they have uh, conferences that focus on the foundation and the uh, uh, the theories, the framework and everything. And there's the one that was more practical. Like, you know, you have Sigmod and VLDB that mostly in the foundations. And then you have ICDE, which is basically on the engineering side of things, right? So I think probably we should uh, look at those models in terms of how we go about defining the vision, right? So, so this is just as a preamble to what um, I'm about to say. Next slide, please. Um, so if you can just keep, because it's actually, I thought I would do it myself. Yeah, that, thank you, that's all. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, the design of software services, I think um, uh, I'm gonna focus on the IoT-based uh, systems because they are very, very you know, particular in the sense that uh, they can be extremely complex, right? Uh, depending on the application, whether it's a smart home, smart city, smart aging, what is about autonomous cars and the likes, you know, you can go as, as long as the uh, Hadron Collider, right? I mean, we have like, you know, literally almost millions of sensors that are inside, right? And you're trying to figure out actually the smallest particle that uh, exists in the universe. Um, so, so the idea there is that to engineer these systems, actually, and you want you don't want to engineer at the data level, because at the end of the day, what you want is you want to juice. The juice is essentially either, you know, in the case of the Hadron uh, Collider, is to find that particle uh, or the behavior of a particle. Uh, in the case of autonomous cars here, is basically to understand the context and to take action. Right, I mean, whether it's a driving, whether it's braking, whether it's actually a vehicle. So, and a lot of things need to actually happen before you do that. I mean, it, it's not the data, it's actually the understanding, which when you talk about and this is the AI based, it, it's, it's very, very uh, complex actually uh, systems that we're talking about here. Uh, next slide, please. So, so and uh, the, we, if we look just at cars, you know, the latest cars, you know, they have more than 100 sensors, you know, monitoring various parts of the car, and this multiply. So, and then you have sensors like, you know, the Fitbit, the health sensors. Next, please. Um, and then you have, as I said, the Hadron, where you have, literally you have a lot of data, and then you have uh, traffic and environmental type of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of sensors. So, and each system is actually maybe different from the another one. So you, you can't really replicate Right, whatever you learn in one to another, because the, like for instance, for cars, the thing that is the most important is reliability and safety. Right, if you go for instance for smart aging, it's about actually accuracy that actually an event has happened. It's not so much actually that you need. It's not like you know the, in the next second, right? Whereas in the case of cars, you know if you don't act in the next second, you may actually kill somebody. Right. It, it, so in terms of uh, so. And it will actually vary. So that, that's what, looking at the best techniques and how we go about designing those uh, uh, software uh, and, 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 and engineering those software services uh, is, is going to be uh, uh, critical. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Okay. And last but not least, our uh, SEC General Chair, Murinda Singh. Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, hi everyone. So, um, well, l l let me just begin by saying, so I'm uh, Munendra Singh. I've been working in AI primarily, uh, initially for my PhD work on multi-agent systems, and for the last 20 years or so, which is much of my career, I worked on services. So I've, I've sort of been fortunate to work on two important areas. Um, I thought in this presentation I would take a take a deeper, like step back and take a you know a deeper, broader vision of what's going on and especially when we talk about software services engineering, we could 
think of them from, from a, fr a fresh perspective, which I call uh, social technical systems. So if you go to the next page. Uh, so th this picture uh, outlines a, you know, what you might think of as of a system in, when it's running and the system, how it's designed. So if you look at the, the right frame, the red big frame, you know, up above we have what I call the social tier and below that green line in the middle, we have the technical tier. The social tier is where people live, organizations live, uh, we call them stakeholders. The other ones who are, you know, the reason for the system that we're talking about. Uh, below the line in the technical tier, we have agents, you know, software agents, you could say, or hardware agents. We have data, devices, uh, everything. Uh, so a lot of the traditional work on uh, software engineering has tended to focus on the technical tier. They always begin by talking about requirements uh, to their credit, but they think that the requirements can be compiled out. That they can be taken out of the out of the system. Uh, when we're talking about systems of the kind that are coming about, like AI-infused systems, and especially uh, you know, in, in, the, in the vision of, uh, uh, of uh, service software engineering, we can't really compile out the requirements. And that's the section on the left. So the left frame, the narrow frame, uh, tells us that you know, we, we start off with uh, stakeholders, but the stakeholders would have things like requirements, they would have value preferences, risk attitudes, uh, the con considerations that drive them. Figuring those out is non-trivial. Uh, I think, as uh, my, uh, my colleagues mentioned, some of them, you know, people don't lay out their requirements explicitly. Uh, our challenge is to specify from those systems this social technical system. So whereas when you specify a software system, traditionally a purely technical system, either we might use something like temporal logic and lay out the actions that, or a, or a finite state machine and lay out the actions uh, that, the, that the software will take. When you're talking about a social technical system, we also have to specify how the interactions of the stakeholders might take place. You know, what are the properties of the environment, and how to measure it? How to, you know, what what are the metrics by which we would uh, make sure that the system is behaving correctly? So, in other words, what you're trying to achieve is um, not just the technology, but the but considerations such as the, for example, certification and governance, and you want to do it computationally. So, uh, typically, when people talk about governance of the internet, they mean it's like an offline process. You know, like there's a committee that sits and does something, and then six months later, some software works. But when you're talking about the kinds of things that we are interested in, the governance has to happen in real time, you know, along with the system uh, functioning. And I think that's one fundamental difference, which a distinction I like to bring out. So there's a dis distinction between automation and autonomy. And a lot of our focus today is on automation, you know, which is to make devices move fast. But autonomy is not just about automation, it's uh, also about uh, accountability, you know, about able to act in a uh, in a social context. So if you go to the next page, uh, I try to, I, I, I think uh, Atman said we, we, uh, we should not reinvent the wheel, but I thought, you know, what we need is a new wheel. <laughs> so, so in this new wheel, I think of four components, you know, when you think of systems broadly. So there is the, uh, at the upper part, uh, is systems engineering. Uh, on the left is intelligence, where the AI uh, technologies come into play. The lower side is the humans, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, not just HCI, but humans in a, in a deeper sense. And on the right, we have governance. So let, let me explain these uh, four things briefly. So the main consideration when you talk about systems engineering at, at the upper level is quality. You know, we have some quality metrics. When you talk about intelligence, the concern is, for example, bias or you know, how, the, how the data is being interpreted. When you talk about humans, the concern is values, which today are not you know, generally uh, well modeled. And when you talk about governance, the concern would be norms, like laws and other you know, regulatory agencies. And then you might have techniques such as you know, technology, uh, technological methods dealing with architecture, trust, you know, uh, contestation. There are many others. I'm just giving examples. And of course, accountability. Uh, and then the end goal of it would be uh, at the systems level to achieve some certification of the system. So like in, uh, to use Atman's example of autonomous vehicles individually, as well as when they are in ensembles. You know. Or in uh, Elisa's example from yesterday, maybe about uh, not just individual drones, but swarms of drones. So they don't, you know, they, they could be individually good, but they could still be killing people together. Um, uh, in intelligence, the ch one challenge could be intelligibility. That's what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, with human values, what you're trying to accomplish is is democratization, which means that it's not the system is not being imposed on on a public to use. It's being the stakeholders themselves decide based on their values how they want it to behave, how they want the services uh, uh, to be engineered, and then. Uh, on governance, the, the, the main task is to align the software entities, the technology part, with the social part. You know, to keep that alignment in terms of making sure that it's behaving the way the way it ought to behave. So when you put these together, 
I think they also give us a, a roadmap for education. Um, you know, when you think of you know how we train our students, uh, we we today uh, our curricula are overwhelmingly focused on on the technology side, and then we throw in some HCI as an afterthought. We say, well, you know, a few of you can learn HCI, and by the way, you know, when you do HCI, make sure you know your your browser windows are nice and you 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 know use big TypeScript or something, right? Uh, we we don't really think about the uh, human aspects from a computational standpoint in terms of you know modeling the values of the people, and we certainly don't worry about the uh, um, the computational modeling of the societal aspects reflected in the governance. So those are the things that we need to teach our uh, our students right from the start, and that typically would mean that we would uh, you know begin with more concrete examples uh, uh, of of projects, and some of the the ones that, for example, Rong mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, would would be appropriate, and as, as I think uh, Steve also pointed out, the uh, the need for instruction and you know how to how to have these uh, well circumscribed ten week projects which will reflect which are reflective of you know large major problems. Um, and similarly, uh, you know uh, Ernesto uh, Ernesto also commented on you know the, the the need for AI and not not just looking at the technology of the like computer networks and clouds, but of you know how to develop AI based systems. And I want to close with the Deans. I want to uh, thank him for showing that SEC is actually at the center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> with a new name, maybe. <laughs> all right. So that complete the, uh, the introduction part. Uh, thank you for all the panelists for your interesting uh, teaser that uh, hopefully can stimulate many good questions here in the audience. So uh, now floor is open for you to ask questions. At the back right there. Okay. Will you start moving the mic, please? Uh, I don't, yeah, now it works. Yeah. I really like the lot of your roadmap, is what we need. But, uh, you know, there is an important aspect, which is uh, the economics, because all this, is, you know, somehow <laughs> it deals on, on economies. So where do you, I mean, uh, is this an aspect which pervades all the aspects, or perhaps is it the values? Yeah, I, I think it shows up, um, ec the economic aspects will show up uh, most immediately in the governance notions, because that's where the incentives come into play. So I, when I said norms, I, I you know really could be interpreted as norms and incentives. Uh, but of course, it also reflects values because there are trade-offs, right? You, we all, for example, using the example of uh, autonomous vehicles, we we would all want perfect safety. But perfect safety might require building a tank, right, uh, which never can never can you know suffer in a crash. Uh, but that that turns out to be impractical for various other reasons. So it's trading off these competing values. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah. means that your system may continuously change. It, exactly, it, it'll have to change. Yes, it will have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, that's, that's... gentlemen at the back, back row, number fourth row, from coming from the back. So, uh, first of all, thank you for. Um, for your presentation. I have a question that is probably directed to Ernesto and uh, Stephen. Since uh, Stephen talk about education and Ernesto talk about uh, um, development of services guided by AI. So I would like to know uh, what is your take um, on the role of service engineers in the medium term in a world where we really started developing system, at least partially in a completely automated way guided by um, AI. Thank you. Who wants to go first? I, I, I can I can say something on this. Uh, well, the role of the system engineers, uh, as I said, we will all of us uh, will need to integrate the perspective, what is called today the AI perspective, but uh, into the work that we do. And uh, let me give you an example because it came to my mind when from what Atman was presenting. In a vehicular networks, you need to have services, and those services need to have low latency. There is nothing to be, I mean, if, if the latency high, the best thing will not work. So you need not only to have an AI system that will do something, for example, we suggest whether to break or not, but you also need that AI system to be able to answer 
to the a video image of the position where it is or a map of the traffic be within 10 milliseconds from, from that moment. The second, this second requirement is also an AI problem. It's the needs the services to be located close enough in terms of the latency. And of course, traditionally at design time, you would solve it via what? Via traditional optimization technique, because you would put the services state statically in the best positions. But now we are driving around, right? So there's no way. We need to have runtime intelligence. Do we need to use runtime intelligence in the at the layers of the protocol and runtime intelligence to run runtime intelligent application? So I think that this is not is not another business. It's not the business of the people from AI, whoever they might be. It's our business because all the technology is going to sort of take this into is is changing to take this into account. So we need to incorporate. And as I said before, and then I stop here. Nobody can do it for us because we know the type of knowledge that we need to represent. We know the distances. We know the optimization, uh, runtime optimization that we can deliver in the framework of this type of, of uh, intelligent infrastructure. So I believe that we, this is our our uh, uh, bailiwick for for the next uh, uh, decade. Anyone would like to add to? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I can add a little. Uh, I think those are great comments from Ernesto. I, I just want to point out that. Maybe we need to rethink the, the notion of layering uh, in architectures that we have been using. So people, for example, you know, we have this UDP, TCP uh, application layer, and then we do stuff high, high up. Uh, I would argue that in most cases, this, the, like the intermediate, intervening layers like TCP, for example, they, they are disastrous, right? It's better not to have to, to worry about those layers. So maybe think differently and use intelligence from the uh, user level uh, down at the infrastructure level. If I can think, thank you, uh, Monindar. Uh, if I can add one more thing that actually is very relevant here, and that's probably, to me, the uh, make or break aspect if we were to be able to make a big dent in terms of automating and, and using uh, services, uh, especially in the area of IoT, and that is ethics. Ethics, I think, is going to be the, the most crucial part because we're talking about people's lives, whether when people are aging, whether people are moving around or in a car, decisions have to be made right then. So when the pandemic hit, we had to make very, very difficult ethical decisions. I remember that in Italy, at the beginning, there's this wave and then they had an issue with capacity and they had to make a decision whether to give, you know, those ventilators to young or old, and they did actually make those decisions. They, they, they had to. It seems like whenever we automate, we, 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 are, we, we can't make those decisions. And, and I think we need, and, and those decisions, of course, are going to be very dynamic. They can't be programmed and then forgotten about. They had to be actually changed. The context would be different. So to me, this is really the crucial part in that aspect that actually probably only us can uh, address it. Thank you. How about here, this end, you would like to add to it? Or no? I can, okay. So I remember um, it was maybe four or five years at the International Conference on Rebooting Computing. We had a similar panel and the panel chair asked, so for the task of asking the car to drive from here 50 miles completely independently, when do you think it will be achieved? And I raised my arm and said in, in 20, not, not before 20 years. And so why did I answer that way? And, and there are different people. So it was five years ago, there are people who were saying it will be in five years, three years, etc. So we as technologists here can accomplish that task within some reasonable time, which is much shorter. Um, but then after that, you know, you need some sort of governance that Munindar was talking about. So what happens when the car crashes, whose responsibility is, and, and, and I'm not sure if you're familiar, I think in Arizona was in the same state, it was the case where they, uh, that where there was an issue which slowed down dramatically. Okay. So then after the governance, you need to make this international because, you know, Germany produces a car, Italy, France. Where do you deploy them? How are you going to do that? So it's going to be uh, quite
quite some time. The way I like to think about it is from other dimension, there's the human in the loop, you know, where you need to ask human for every single decision. There's human on the loop who sits a little bit outside and is occasionally looking at it and then computer human completely outside of the loop. So there'll be evolution in some constrained environments like airports where you will have fully automated, uh, but then it will still take 20 plus years to have fully automated arbitrary uh, decision making. Thank you. Uh, De De Hong, since, uh, since you are talking here, uh, I just thought about your earlier uh, talk about the mega trends. Uh, you start with the digital transformation, sustainability, then metaverse. Right? The more I think about it, I think that it seems to me that ordering is very logical because the digital transformation has been happening and uh, we need to solve this sustainability problem first before we move into the mega, uh, the metaverse. Uh, can, I cannot imagine how much power you need to, you know, to uh, propel or power these uh, billions of digital twins. That seems to be logical. So my understanding is correct. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, I try to you have uh, try to help you to understand on the bus uh, what we really mean by SSE. Just Thank kidding. Uh, any more questions here? Okay, we do have one, one and two. Thank you very much. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the research directions? on requirements for malisms in the new era of, of software, software service engineering? Requirements for medicine? For example, I've used temporal logic, but I think that it, this should, shouldn't be enough in this new era. So I would like to know if you can talk a little bit about research directions on uh, requirements and provides formalisms in service engineering. Yes, so uh, the question is about how do you do uh, the cutting edge requirements engineering for these uh, novel services, including digital health, smart city, all these IoT based uh, applications. So you would like to uh, give uh, thanks. I, I'm sure all, many of us have opinions about it. Uh, I, I think for requirements, one thing to note is that we should s step away from individual nodes. You know, a, a lot of the focus in traditional software engineering is to build either single node systems or systems that are essentially homogenous systems. The nodes are all identical. Here we are thinking about multiple stakeholders. So capturing the, the changes to not deal with a single stakeholder, but multiple stakeholders. To So we model, uh, essentially we have to capture uh, we need requirements for social protocols, not just for the communication protocol. We want to capture how the interaction between the stakeholders takes place and how the, and then figure out how the technology will assist, uh, you know, the, the, those interactions. And partly it also includes an understanding, you know, modeling human values more precisely to take into account. And I could tell you more, but I think my colleagues will have, a, I, we can tell, uh, talk offline as well. Yep. I, I just very quick. I, I don't know if I uh, I can add something to this answer, which was already very good. And uh, uh, but I would like to say something. We will have to have this type of uh, uh, reconciliation between uh, what could would be symbolic representation, and the symbolic representation, of course, temporal is is one of uh, is a key technique. And uh, uh, if you look at, uh, I don't want to go back to that column, but in that column we wrote uh, in a triple computer, we were discussing exactly this thing. There are some requirements and behaviors which are best represented in a symbolic form and precedence relations there are all of these type of things on the other hand if you want in many cases you have to do a verification and you have the basically uh, uh, how can i say the evidential the observables and uh, you learn uh, so I think that we need uh, uh, to uh, both sides. We need a sides of symbolic representation, and we need a way to check it out and do the verification based uh, on uh, uh, the observable. And the observables are observables that, well, uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a world which will be flooded with observables. So the problems will not be the, the usual one of the bounded buffer. You know? <laughs> we will have problems uh, 
of, the, of verification that uh, defy, I mean, from the complexity point of view, uh, will really be a big challenge. But I think it's uh, both sides. I mean, the symbolic thing will, will be needed anyway. Um, for the for the requirement, uh, I it seems like like IoT. Uh, I think the requirements need to be contextual. Okay, and a uh, um, very very simple thing is you have a business level requirement, you have a technical level requirements. Once you understand that's a that, that's a contextual requirement, then the challenge becomes how do you maintain the relations between all kinds of requirements especially when you're coming from the business requirement at a high level, go all the way down to your implementation requirement. Very often we found out it's a one-way street. So once everything is done and you change anything at the bottom, I mean the implementation, very often people don't know what it means to the original requirement that they the designed for. So I think the continuous challenging for the software service engineering area is how can we make the requirements be a first class citizen in all phases and make sure they are connected and make sure they are contextual. Yeah, I think uh, regarding requirement, there are two major aspects. One is to identify the requirement. Ron already talked about from business aspect, technical aspect. And another aspect is when you first define the requirement, you don't know whether that worked well or not. So the feedback from the user, as soon as possible, not wait for 10 years or five years, okay? So that's one aspect. Another aspect is once you have a sufficient confidence in the requirement you identify, then make sure in the development process, in the sub subsequent process, design, uh, implementation, coding, and uh, installation, and all those things, how, whether they comply with the requirement. Requirement compliance. It sounds like uh, easy, because when you do the testing, you do test a uh, uh, certified functional requirement or non-functional requirement and so forth. Even that is difficult, but how we can continuously, because keep in mind, when we talk about the develop the service software, service area, you continue to evolve, not just uh, during the development phase, after the development phase, in the user application phase, utilization phase, we continuously get the feedback and we welcome, we solicit input from the user. And then mm -hmm. you can improve. Machine learning is great in doing that, but how we handle it efficiently and how we can encourage or put some pressure and to the user to provide the feedback for not just for the system, it's for the entire community, for the advances of our uh, benefit. So I think that when we talk about the service, that can broaden the scope of software. The software is for services. Thank you. Right. I think it's a hit me that uh, uh, in this kind of uh, like autonomous autonomous driving, uh, you get feedback from the environment or from the user uh, in real time, and that uh, how do you deal with that feedback? And uh, the, the requirements may change right on the fly. And uh, all these kind of uh, some of these are uh, hot deadline issues. So I think you know for temporal logic, actually real time temporal temporal logic seems to be become very important technique for dealing with that. I don't. Uh, we may we move to the next question, please. Okay. So I would like to ask the panelists' the opinion on the role of non-functional aspect in software service engineering. For instance, I took some note. Dejan mentioned about cyber assurance. Munindar mentioned certification, Atman discussed about ethics and reliability. Uh, wrong uh, had uh, non-functional requirements uh, in, uh, at the core of uh, 
is a, a presentation. Ernesto mentioned the AI trustworthiness and Stephen mentioned reliability, cheap reliability, for instance. So uh, where we are in implementing and designing a software service engineering process that support and maintain this non-functional aspect along the whole service life cycle. Thank you. All right, this is perhaps the last question. So we'll go from zone going that way back. Okay. Um, uh, I, mm -hmm. I, would start, I would say, just, if I can only choose one word, I would say assurance. The service assurance aspect of mm -hmm. the software service engineering. Because you know, for, for the, when we talk about software only, we essentially leave the responsibility to the owner of the software. Right? We say, here's the code, you do whatever you like. But when we talk about service, the service provider basically do almost do everything for the service consumer. So the assurance aspect is very important and it's getting exponentially complicated right now. That's, that's a very good response. So we go, go to the next, right? and everyone gave a keyword, just like what the Long did. And then we conclude the panel. Uh, Professor Yao, you have any, any additional, or we pass to the Hong? We pass to the Hong right for now, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't have one word. I think it's really hard and every provider needs to invest a lot of effort, you know. I mean, every single aspect is important, you know. Uh, security, scalability, reliability, all of them. I mean, you could package it in assurance, but um, you still have to support them all and it matters whether you'll stay in business or not. You can theorize, you can provide best practices, standards, etc., but uh, you still have to invest a lot into it. I will try to say five words, not one, because one, one, one <laughs> thank you very much. One, one, mm -hmm. I wouldn't know, but uh, the five words are this. First of all, we need to understand what these uh, uh, non-functional properties are and how can we measure them. I would like just to point to the work, for example, done by the INISA working groups. They came out with the attempt, and it, we are still in the process. Because if we want to make the metric, can we be the med metric or any way verifiable? So this, the, the, those, those non-functional properties. I'm sure uh, the others will comment on that. But I want to add to this. I believe there are two ways to impose non-functional properties of interest, or especially the one of ethical interest, education and police. Education is the design time. And police is the assurance time. And police, I mean, verification on the runtime observables, which is exactly what. So the, the, uh, the problem is that both of these problems are very complex, both in inherent complexity and in practical complexity in the new situation we are, where we have this flood of observables and data. So this is my, my answer. Uh, one word, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'll, I'll give a slightly longer answer. I, I think uh, maybe the two words are you know, job security. <laughs> I, I think job security for people in this community, because the situation is pretty. You know, we, we don't know we, we don't know what we don't know how, what people want. We don't have a method for capturing that. We don't have full languages for uh, proper languages for capturing it. We don't have representational frameworks. We don't know reasoning. You know, we so there every everything that we're doing, we are doing. Uh, we are headed in the right direction, but everything is really far behind where it needs to be. Okay, my one word is usability. <laughs> Not a usability for the expert or developer, for the average user. We want their input, right? And what kind of input? And it should be easy. If you make it difficult, <laughs> you don't get it. So any service system we have, software we have, must be easy to use, especially our software is expected to be modified and uh, continue to evolve. And uh, we all know we get used to one version. And uh, now the manufacturers say, hey, we have a better, have a new version. Then uh, change a lot of the icon and other things. And uh, that only causes a lot of <coughs> headache for the user. And uh, then uh, because of that, some of the user may switch to use the system. So my one word, yeah, the usability. I think that uh, really uh, give a very good uh, concluding uh, remark that uh, after all, services is for users. So usability, user experience is, I think, is the, is the king. Eventually, 
as I shared with you, I lost the phone. Uh, and uh, lost a, a phone is is a is a major headache. You know, uh, you're gonna get harassed by lots of people. Uh, you no, know, I cannot remember my serial serial number of my phone. I don't know anything about IMEI number, the thirty thirty digit number. I cannot. The OTP won't work because I lost my phone. I cannot receive OTP. So, so how do you help people? User, okay. User is the king. And when we talk about services, yes, uh, Alisa has a final <laughs> remark. Change your agent. No, we'll be intelligent agents. Intelligent agents. We'll be agent. only humans. Mm -hmm. okay? Users would be ah, machines, okay. robots. They need their own services <coughs> as well. So let's keep yeah. this in mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to use more power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I think that uh, if my uh, co chair doesn't object, I think that we uh, can just end here. And we'd like to thank our uh, panelists for your excellent. Uh, talk and remarks and uh, all your uh, feedback. Thank you.